na corner si se. Today we come concerning the press briefing where the Ministry of Information and Communication can call every Thursday. Now we go inside the conference room for go witness the press briefing. I now invite the Deputy Minister of Information and Communication for our weekly press updates and the introduction of our guest speakers. Madam Minister. Uh, Deputy Minister of Technical and Higher Education, Dr. Senesi, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen of the Fourth Estate, apologies for starting um, the press conference um, a little late. We actually had um, another engagement in Parliament. But like we say, it's um, better late than never. We're here now, so we want to apologize profusely for starting late. Let me welcome you to this press conference, the usual Thursday press briefing. Um, as always, we start with the updates for the week. And I must state here that charity begins at home, so I'll start, I'll begin the weekly updates with um, the Ministry of Information and Communications. The Ministry of Information and Communications have commenced press conferences at regional and district levels. The first district press conference has been held today, 14th November 2019, in Makeni City and was hosted by the Minister of Information and Communications, Mohamed Rahman Suari. The conference attracted journalists and local dignitaries across Bombali District. His Excellency President Julius Madabio is in Tangier, Morocco, as guest of honor to attend the 12th edition of the Midays Forum, slated for 13th to 16th November 2019. The Midays Forum is organized each year under the patronage of His Majesty King Mohammed VI of Morocco. This event is one of the biggest international platforms between Africa and the Arab world. Earlier this week, President Dr. Julius Madabio was in France to attend the Paris Peace Forum and UNESCO General Conference from the 11th to the 13th of November 2019. The Paris Peace Forum is the annual international meeting for all actors of global governance initiated by the French President, His Excellency Emmanuel Macron. The maiden edition of the, peace, of the Paris Peace Forum was held in November last year where around 65 heads of state and government, as well as 10 leaders from international organizations attended. In another related engagement, last Friday, His Excellency President of Julius Madabio called on the economic community of West African states, ECOWAS, to take urgent action on the deteriorating political situation in Guinea-Bissau and prevent any instability in the region. He made this call at the extraordinary session of the ECOWAS heads of state and government convened in Niamey by the chairman of the Authority of Heads of State and Government and President of the Republic of Niger, His Excellency Maham Madu Isufu. The Minister of Planning and Economic Development, Dr. Francis Kaikai, was in Nairobi, Kenya for a three-day international conference that ended on the 12th of November, 2019 on population development, on population and development ICPD 25 at the Kenyatta International Conference Center. The summit was aimed at mobilizing political and financial momentum to advance the ICPD agenda, which is key in achieving the 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development around harnessing demographic dividends, reducing maternal and child mortality, and eradicating gender violence. The Parliament of Sierra Leone on Tuesday, 12 November 2019, extensively debated and passed into law with some amendments, the bill entitled the Finance Act 2020. The bill is aimed at the alteration and imposition of taxes for the services of the Republic of Sterling for the financial year 2020. The bill was piloted by the Minister of Finance, Jacob, Jukus, Jacob Jusu Safa, who said, among other things, that the act was seeking to provide for the imposition and alteration of taxes as to give effect to the financial proposals of the government and to provide for other related matters for the 2020 financial year. The Deputy Minister of Transport and Aviation, Sadiq Sila, on Wednesday, 13th November, met with stakeholders in the transport sector to deliberate on traffic rules and regulations. The meeting was followed by the launch of the $50 million World Bank funded integrated and resilient urban mobility project, which aims at improving access to quality public transportation, address climate resilience, and advance road safety in selected areas, as well as enhance institutional capacity in the transport sector. 
Well, that's all we have for uh, my update for this week. Um, as you may already know, we have in our midst the Deputy Minister of Technical and Higher Education, Dr. Surat Tennessee. As the Ministry, the Ministry of Technical and Higher Education are deploying all the skills and testing models necessary to bring about the total transformation of technical and higher education in Sierra Leone. These include, but not limited to, the design and review of policies, stabilizing staff salaries and wages, provide subventions to universities, polytechnics, colleges, and other institutions, especially public institutions, in addition to fees collected in an effort to cover operational cost, identification and de deployment of staff with the relevant skills to assist government in the transformation of technical and higher education in Sierra Leone and many more. So like I mentioned, we have the Deputy Minister in our midst here this afternoon and I'd like to invite him to the podium to please come and give us more insights to this particular development. Thank you very much, Dr. Surat Tennessee. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is my first appearance here, and of course, it has been my wish to be with you. And I want to say very many thanks to the Deputy Minister for inviting me to be here today. You all will uh, certainly agree with me that uh, there was just a single ministry in this country, the Ministry of Education. And uh, as a party, before coming to power, what we did was to do lots and lots of consultations across the country. And we realized that there was a need for us to split the Ministry of Education. And as such, we have the Ministry of Basic and Senior Secondary School, and then of course we have the Ministry of Technical and Higher Education, for which I'm here representing that ministry as a Deputy Minister for that ministry. Fortunately, and again, unfortunately, I will say, uh, my minister is not around, but of course he is with the president, attending to some other very important matters out of Sierra Leone. So I'm here to give this update with respect to what we've been doing as a ministry. As uh, the deputy minister rightly said, this ministry was created with the hope that we are going to transform technical and higher education in this country. Before now, there used to be just a directorate and a former ministry dealing with technical and higher education. So you all would agree with me that we made very little progress over the years, especially when it comes to technical and vocational training in this country. So the creation of this new ministry is to revamp that particular sector, the technical and vocational training. And of course, again, give much more value again to tertiary education in this country that is responsible for university training and that of teacher education training. The basic reason why that ministry was established by His Excellency the President, to give it much more value again. <coughs> so, we also realized that over the years, because of the neglect of that sector, we had too many strike actions. Programs that are supposed to last for four years. You see students going five, six, seven years. And we had a lot of problems, a lot of strike actions across the country. And you realize again that the output in terms of the students we are turning over to the society, very poor. You all agree with me. You all will agree with me on that. So what we want to do is to transform the entire sector this time around. And to do that, as you rightly said, we are doing so to ensure that uh, we design and review policies. Because if you do not have a guiding policy, you do not have the rules established, there is no way you're going to transform an institution. So we are doing that. We are also making sure that we stabilize the salaries and wages of workers in both technical and vocational and that of tertiary institutions. We are also doing that. We provide subventions for universities, polytechnics, colleges, and other institutions. And of course, the emphasis here is on public institutions. That's what we are doing. We are doing so all in a bid to ensure that there is quality assurance in the delivery of knowledge and the knowledge industry, I would say. That's the reason why we are doing all of this. So 
I'll start by highlighting the issue with respect to the design and review of policies. Currently, there are some existing policies that have been used over the years that guide the operations and management of tertiary institutions in Sierra Leone. They are there. As a government, we believe that most of these policies and acts do not address contemporary issues that shape the advancement of tertiary institutions and at the same time meet global competitiveness. Because that's the basic reason. We're not only producing the knowledge to just fit into our own local system or situation, but also we want to also compete at a global level. So for us to do that, we have to ensure that we have the right type of policies in place. So to do that, what we are doing is to ensure that existing policies like the Universities Act is being reviewed. You have the Universities Act of 2005. Since that time to now, we've never reviewed that one. And uh, we've realized that for us to advance the university education in Sierra Leone, there is a need for us to review that one. So we are in the process of reviewing that. And we have already crossed the first phase of that review process, where we invited members of the academia, major stakeholders like the TEC, the NCTVA, and major academics in Sierra Leone. That one was chaired by the Tertiary Education Commission chairman, chairperson, Professor Algali. We've crossed that one. The next stage now is we are now broadening the consultative aspect with respect to the review. So now we are taking it to the people. We'll be here in Freetown on the 20th. Mem members of press, you are all invited. We're also inviting the civil society organizations. Line ministries are going to be invited to read. And this time around, again, the students are going to have their own scene in the review process of the Universities Act. Because what we want to do is to have a holistic document where the content is rich, and then it will stand the test of time. That's what we want to do. We want to have the scene of the students. We want to have the scene of those lecturers who were not opportune to be part of the first phase. So this time around, that is what we are going to do. While we are doing that, Simultaneously also, we have deployed four models. Four models that are going to also feed into the review process. Four models. One such model is that we started off by making sure that we deploy professors above the age of 65 years in acting positions, and then we gauge their outputs. In administrative, when once we appoint them in administrative position. So we have deployed that first model. The professors above the age of 65, because the University's Act is saying at the age, after the age of 65 years, the current one, that, the one that we have, which we are now reviewing, that you may, you, 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 your services might be hired, but then you cannot occupy administrative positions in the university. But then the question here is this suppose there is much more strength. There's much more knowledge that you need in, in, in the knowledge industry. What do you do? So what have we done? We've deployed that first model, put them in acting position, allow them to serve some time, and see what will be the output. We have done that one. We've crossed that stage. Now we have gauged the output. The second phase that we have done is to now confirm their positions, let them be substantive, and again gauge the output. Why are we saying this? We want to gauge the confidence level of those individuals. When they feel that they are not vulnerable, what will be the output? So we've confirmed that one again, and they are in those positions. The third model that we have also deployed, which all, all of these are going to feed into the review process, get those that are within the middle cadre in terms of the university system. And these are the senior lecturers. Because you move from the RTA, you go to lecturer, uh, 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 lecturer two, then from the lecturer two, you go to lecturer one. From lecturer one, then you go now to the senior lecturer. From senior lecturer, then you go to professor. That's the roadmap in the university system. So now what we have done, we have again deployed those senior lecturers in the institutions in acting positions. And we've been able to gauge again their performance. So the final model that we have again deployed is now make them substantive. Let them have the confidence that now they are not acting, and let us also gauge their output. And we are getting amazing results. 
All of these four models, including the first phase of the review, and that of the second phase we are going to uh, start on the 20th, all of these uh, models or strategies are going to feed into the entire review process of the University's Act of 2005. Also, the Tertiary Education Commission Act 2001 is also under review. At the point in time when it was drafted, we had very few institutions across the country. Now we have many. And we've also seen the proliferation of private universities and colleges in Sierra Leone. So now there is a need for us to review that process also. Now the review is ongoing, of course, again, for the validation of that document, we are now waiting on the TEC to put the logistics together and then certainly we take it again to the public for the final validation of that document. This one might be very strange. And I have to say it here. That we've been running our education, our education system in Sierra Leone for decades without a national qualification framework. Sierra Leone. All these years after independence, going through, we've been running an educational system without a national qualification framework. The national qualification framework is one that tells you that you can get into the technical and vocational institutes, you progress, and with time, when you have a change of mind and you want to go academic, there is a clearly defined roadmap. All of you, you've gone to all the universities and teacher training colleges. No national qualification framework. The national qualification framework is also supposed to also define a roadmap for somebody that is in academia but wants to go now professional and wants to go into skills training. There is no roadmap. There is no document defining those roadmap for us in Sierra Leone in terms of our educational or training policies. You go to some other countries, you see people, they qualify with a PhD in skills training. But in Sierra Leone, over the years, and again, the reason why we have problems with the middle-level manpower training, we relegated TVET, or we ascribed TVET to only those that are dropouts in society. So you see the struggle entering the university, everybody is moving towards the university rather than going into skills training. And that is what is important in terms of the development of a society, the middle level manpower training. That is very key in terms of national development, which is completely absent in Sierra Leone. When I was doing the monitoring at Frabe College, the rehabilitation that is taking place there, when I was talking to the contractors and the other people, majority of them are coming from Guinea. And I asked the question, why is it that, I mean, these are painters, hmm? these are electricians. You cannot employ people here. And the contractor said, we cannot. I said, why? He said, most of your guys, we have painters, but they are not trained to do painting. You have electrician, but they are not. And he said, let me prove it to you. He took me to one of the hostel, the rooms. And he said, you see the paint on the ceiling? Look at the wall. You see the way the paint is running on the wall? He said, and then this guy do not know that that one is not correct. He said, that's not how you work. He said, the reason why we are bringing people that are trained. So over the years, we've lost that. So what, I'm, what I want to say here is that the National Qualification Framework, we are now developing that one. And of course, we also invited too many, the universities, teachers, uh, NCTV, TEC, uh, the public, civil society organizations are there. They are now helping us with other foreign uh, partners. They are helping us to develop the national qualification framework for Sierra Leone, the first we are going to have in the history of this country. Also, we have completed uh, the, the strategic plan of the ministry. Remember, I told you this, the, uh, this is a new ministry. There is no way we are going to navigate, navigate around the issues if we do not have a strategic plan. So as a ministry, we've concluded that one, of course, we validated it, and now it is a question of popularizing that one. 
again, there used to be a TVET policy, but very old and no more fit for purpose. So what we have done also is to review that one. We have reviewed that one. We've concluded that one, done validation, taken to cabinet, and it has been approved. So now we, now, we are now at the phase where we have to popularize it and, of course, start the implementation. And then the question is, somebody will want to ask, why do you want a TVET policy? If you go around Freetown, provincial towns, the villages, etc., you see, you go sometimes to the back of the house, you meet a technical and vocational training institute there. Some do not have the qualified personnel. They do not have workshops. The necessary tools that are supposed to be there for training purposes, they are not there. And because of the fact that we have multinational agencies or NGOs coming in with funds, everybody is going in to establish a technical institute. You have the proliferation of technical institutes all over the place. Substandard, no quality. So now the TVET policy that we have designed is now going to guide the process of anyone wanting to establish a technical institute in Sierra Leone. There are guiding principles with respect to the way you develop the curriculum, the mode of delivery, how do you do your admission, the admission requirements, they are all clearly defined. And we've also done that to ensure that we do not du duplicate resources. We should not be having, in fact, the one I usually do not want to listen to is the one when people talk about Garata and Dying. Something is really wrong. We should be graduating above that and say, we want to deploy the state of the art equipment in our technical and vocational training institutes. Not using traditional tools. You go to those places, the carpentry shops. What do you find there? Carpenter, uh, uh, hammer. The man is telling you, tell, talking to you about carpentry. You find hammer. Those uh, power, uh, that, uh, manual saw. Those things are there. You see the man profusely sweating. Spend so much time with little output. So what we want to do is to deploy state-of-the-art equipment in the training institutions. The reason why we have developed this uh, TVET policy. Also, there is another policy we have also, we are also reviewing, and that is the teacher policy. Most institutions are running teacher training programs. Go and look at the curricula they are implementing. They are not standardized. Entry requirements, not standardized. Examinations, not standardized. But all other, you see, most of them, they are running teacher training across the country. So the teacher policy is coming to make sure that there is a direction and there is a focus for teacher training in Sierra Leone. Having said that, these are a few of the policies we are, uh, we are reviewing, and some of them are also new ones we are designing, all, desi all geared towards making sure that we shape the focus of education and training in Sierra Leone. Stabilizing the payments of salaries and wages. We can't do all of this if we do not stabilize the payments of wages and salaries for our personnel in the universities, teacher training colleges, and that of the TVET institutions. So what we have done is that before now we used to send subvention to those institutions. Well, for some reasons, the payments of wages and salaries never been prioritized. So you see a lot of strike actions. Sometimes subventions are sent to the institutions, they pay only two months, and then there is an, another one month not paid, and we have too many problems <coughs> with respect to strike action. Teacher productivity, very low in those institutions. So what we want to do is to correct that. And fortunately, His Excellency has given support to that, and today what we have is that we've integrated the entire teaching staff and our teacher training colleges, universities, into the national payroll. So today they receive their salaries on, on time, and now they have time to do their research, update their lecture notes, provide supervision. They now have the opportunity to also ensure that there is mentoring in the institutions. 
continuous assessment was not part of the academic activities in those institutions, we want to instill that again into those institutions. Because when you get into the institution, you are not supposed to come, come out of the institution without graduating. So the teachers, are, the teachers and lecturers are supposed to mentor the students. But when salaries are not stable, obviously we are all humans. Somebody will have to seek another source because there is also a responsibility on the part of that individual to take care of the family. And when salaries are also not coming on time, there is also a, prob a problem of people or our lecturers not being able to also design their own savings scheme. And we want them to be responsible citizens to their families, to themselves, and to the nation. So what we have done is that we have stabilized that one also. Their salaries are now being paid on time. And the next phase of that, because what we have been doing is that, one, we want to make sure that the salaries are stable. And then thereafter, we now look at some other aspect that has to do with capacity gap in the institutions. The rapid assessment that we have done, we've come to realize that in all of our institutions, especially the universities, most of our lecturers there, they are all master's degree holders. Few PhDs, few professors. And when it comes to international ranking of your institutions, it has a greater negative impact when it comes to staff capacity. As a government, we want to be mentioned among those renowned institutions or universities in the sub-region. So the next phase now, which we have started embarking on, and there is already a directive to the TEC, the Teach, uh, Tertiary Education Commission, to conduct a comprehensive staff capacity assessment in all the institutions. And not only that, we've also instructed them to also again conduct an assessment with respect to the faculty. That we have also requested them to do. We call it the faculty establishment. For each and every department in the faculty, there is supposed to be a minimum number of staff that are supposed to be in that faculty go to some of our departments, teacher training colleges, as well as universities, sometimes you have just three lecturers. Some two. They ask a question. From first year to final year, you are delivering up to 20 to 30 modules. You have to supervise dissertation. You have to uh, do continuous assessment. So, you realize that Supervision is not thorough. Assessment is not thorough. So what we are doing here is we are also making sure that we move to this other phase where we are now doing the faculty assessments. That is what we are doing. So the TEC is being charged with that. At the end of it all, before the end of that, sorry, they are also going to look now at the staff emoluments. Because what we want to do is to do a comprehensive review of the conditions of service of the staff of our institutions. If they do not have the right salaries and wages, then certainly the productivity level is going to be low. So that's the next phase now we are in terms of the salaries and wages or conditions of service of our universities and teacher training colleges uh, staff. I'll now come to the technical and vocational institutes, which I mentioned earlier. Well, just taking over this country as a government, what we've been able to establish is the fact that, well, we have the mandate from His Excellency the President that he wants to see technical and vocational training institutes in each and every district in Sierra Leone. That's the mandate from His Excellency the President. In less than two years, we've been able to establish 10. They are now up and running in the districts. Now we have to also establish another six, which is now part of the budget that was presented. And that's the next, next phase with respect to the establishment of technical and vocational training institutes. Somebody will want to ask the question, do you have the capacity?
The answer to that question is simple. That we start somewhere and then we move on. And that is what we have done. We have a $22 million World Bank funding for technical and vocational institutes in Sierra Leone. And part of that fund is going to be used to buy, as I said earlier, state-of-the-art equipment and tools so that we have the right type of training for those that are going to enter into those institutions. In just less than two months, having reopened those institutions, we've now admitted about 1,280 students in those institutions. So that's the progress so far we've made. And then I'll come now to teacher training. Again, there is this instruction or mandate or we promise the people of this country that we are going to take teacher training to the doorsteps of our people. So what we have done in that direction also is to implement or introduce a kind of model in all the districts. As I'm talking to you now here, we've introduced distance learning in terms of teacher training in all the districts. The model that we have used is one that is very unique. If you take Southern Region, for example, Jalai University is champ champion in that one. That's, Jalai University is the coordinating hall. So what they are doing? Online delivery together with face-to-face -face delivery is the model we've deployed in those districts. So on Fridays, they get to the districts. They teach our brothers and sisters Friday, Saturday, give a lot of assignments, and then they get back to the institutions. And at the same time, they are also coordinating online in areas where you have internet connectivity. So currently, we are experimenting that model and we hope to improve on that model as we move along. Why do we want to have it that way again? That's the question. Somebody will want to ask. The flagship program of this government is free quality education. At the tertiary level, we have a responsibility to supply the quality manpower to those primary and secondary schools. And again, when we did a rapid assessment, we realized that most of the rural communities, they are having schools, but then of course you have untrained and unqualified teachers in those places. So let us say we want to take all of them to Jalai University campus for teacher training, or to Eastern Polytechnic for teacher training, or to EBK for teacher training. Then we end up emptying the classrooms, and then we virtually have problems in those classrooms. So to maintain them in those classrooms and to ensure that they continue doing their teaching, we've introduced the face-to-face -face and online or distance learning teacher training for all the districts. It is going on, very amazing program. The model is really coming up very well. And of course, as we move along, we try to also improve on it. Subvention to tertiary institutions and Sierra Leone since the inception of this government. As a government, we've spent $251 billion on universities, polytechnics, teacher training colleges, less than two years. That's the quantum of money we've spent on these institutions. The reason you are now seeing most of them are boosting of, boosting of what? Doing online application, online registration. They are improving on the internet connectivity on the campuses, and I must say uh, we are very much grateful for the support we are having from the minister and, of course, team from the Ministry of uh, Information and Communications. They've given, they are giving us tremendous support in that area. So these are the areas we are moving in terms of the New Direction program. And then the award of scholarships. Less than two years, the Sierra Leone government grant with awarded 2,450 grants to Sierra Leoneans, and we've also <coughs> nominated a total of 562 scholarships, foreign scholarships, to Sierra Leoneans to study abroad. That's what we've done. And that tells you that when we say we are going to do this, then certainly we'll do it. A talk, talk and do government. We said Education is a priority. So what we have done is to give support in that direction, and these are the people we have awarded scholarships for training in and out of Sierra Leone. The student loan scheme. 
you want to know about that also. The student loan scheme, we have gone too far, of course. The bidding process is almost concluding now, coming to an end for the rehabilitation of the secretariat. We are also in the process of recruiting key staff for the student loan scheme. So I'm sure before commencement of the next academic year, we are going to introduce the student loan scheme for Sierra Leoneans. So if you do not have the opportunity of being awarded the government granting aid, then you will now have the opportunity of having a bite when once we introduce the student loan scheme. So we are getting everybody on board to make sure that we all benefit from the national cake. Also, the establishment of other state universities, I will, not want, I will not wait until you ask me for that one. The feasibility studies, we have already conducted that for the Kono University. The Eastern University, that one also is very much uh, in progress. And uh, we are sure uh, come the next maybe fiscal year, we should uh, be in a position to start action on the ground with respect to the establishment of those universities. Reviving the National Union of Sierra Leone Students. Well, we all know that, I mean, for, for over a decade now, there has been no National Union of Sierra Leone Students in Sierra Leone. There hasn't been one. They used to have appoint, appointed uh, NUS representatives, but there has not been one. Because for you to constitute NUS, it means all the institutions must have student union governments. And then they will have to converge together, con uh, conduct their elections, and then they have their representative or their executive executives. So now, what we have done is, on the 26th of this month, now that we have now uh, the student union government in all tertiary institutions, the 26th of this month, we are going to have the new election. So we're going to have the executive in place, and then of course, the ministry, or this government, to be precise, is ready to give them a lot of support to establish again the student union activities across the country. And fortunately, we now have a uh, the National Electoral Commission giving us technical advice to conduct that election. So we have also, again, crossed that one, and then we are moving on. Enrollment in tertiary institutions and that of uh, staff capacity. Currently, we have a total of 54,300 students. That's what we have currently, 54,300 students. And then, of course, we have 5,028 staff, which tells you we need more to make sure that we deliver on the mandate of His Excellency the President. On that note, I want to pause here, and maybe when it is question time, I will try my best to respond. And where I could not, I think the Minister of Information will provide you that data. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Minister. I'm Dr. Senesi. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Minister of Information just joined us. Earlier I mentioned that he was in McKinney, you know, um, conducting the very first regional press conference. He started in McKinney. Of course, we hope to go to other areas, but he just joined us. He just joined us, sorry, in, the, in, in this press conference. So at this point, I'd like to, as you all know, um, just um, on Tuesday, Parliament extensively debated and passed into law some, um, with, uh, some amendments to bill titled the Finance Act 2020. And um, the Minister would like to talk about the press conference and you know, give us some more information on things that's been happening in the ministry and, of course, within the government. So I'd like to invite him now to the podium, Mr. Minister of Information, please. Gentlemen and ladies, good afternoon. You know, I was just looking at the, the male-female ratio at the press conference. And I discovered with this very large number here, you only have three women, you know? So this is, this is an area we have to do more to improve. I know following the recent reshuffle, um, His Excellency President Bill appointed one woman and there was a lot of concerns all over the place, parroted by some of you guys around the table. So i like to also encourage you to do more to improve gender representation beyond report, reporter level. Women to head newsrooms to be the ultimate phases of you know, your various media outlets. This is not an attack. It's an engagement I like us to have. 
right? Um, when His Excellency recently uh, um, did a reshuffle, you all are aware, um, um, he brought um, additional hands on board um, to support um, service delivery and the um, commitment he has made to the people of Sierra Leone. He brought a woman to add to the existing women in cabinet, which has brought the total number of women in cabinet to something like 27.9%. Over the years, for the last 11 or so years, women were clamoring for 50%, 30% representation in government. In 18 months, His Excellency has been able to clock 27.9%. That is no mean feat. And it is still work in progress. We will get there. I mean, look, so I am saying, even in agenda setting, let it be informed by data. This is what we sadly don't do. I just say, you know, people are all over the place. Oh, no women, no women. Yes, it is work in progress. In the history of our country, no leader has been demonstrably committed to the cause of women more than His Excellency President Bill. In 2012, he is the only candidate who had a fair and square chance of winning the elections who appointed a woman running mate. She could have been vice president if we had won those elections in 2012, right? Fast forward 2018, we have a situation where His Excellency President Bill has passed the most stringent um, um, sexual offenses act in the history of our country. These are all commitments to the cause of women. Again, in the universities, women now doing STEM courses will go to university free. Again, in the 2020 budget, we, within the next three years, we are allocating, government is allocating 100 billion loans to small, medium development enterprises. Of that amount, we will begin with 20 billion next year and women beneficiaries will constitute about 70%. That is a bread and butter issue. It will begin to resolve bread and butter issues. The 70% women who benefit from that national microcredit scheme will now be able to expand their businesses, to grow their businesses, provide livelihood support for themselves and their families. In the process, some can even grow, can, can, you know, can aspire to becoming wealthy, prosperous. So this is what, that is one of the whole, key hallmarks of the 2020 budget. Small, medium enterprises will benefit from 100 billion loans in the next three years, starting with 20 billion next year, to create job opportunities, to create opportunities for women and young people. Because His Excellency clearly is a champion for both young men and women who have been marginalized for far too long, who have not had a voice around the table, who have been reduced to Paibo body, paibo body, you know. So, the other key hallmark of the 2020 budget is the increase of the minimum wage to, um, you know, to 600,000 loans. I mean, the whole essence is to ensure that, I mean, people get take-home salaries that will take their home, right? Because, I mean, since we realize the economy is challenging, but we are doing our best, you know, to ensure that, um, we cushion the effects, we alleviate the effects of the current economic challenges. You come to, probably, Babadi with permission, let me make a few comments on the reshuffle still. Because I think um, we owe the press this. And they, in turn, owe an honest and sincere service to the people of Sierra Leone. I've been hearing about, um, you know, the cost of setting up new ministries. But let me, let me, let me also weigh in on the discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, I've heard people talking about the establishment of new ministries. The establishment of new ministries, a ministry like um, the environment, it is not only essential, many other people have asked me, why are you doing this only now? You ought to have started with it in your first lineup. Well, His Excellency is a learning president. He is a very scrupulous person. He approaches everything, you know, with the points that it requires. Here is a country which is the third most vulnerable to environmental disasters, we all know. Here is a country which has paid more than its fair share of price, you know, when we had um, the mudslide here, Motome. Many, thousands of our compatriots lost their lives. To date, many remain unaccounted for. They are all presumed dead. May their souls rest in peace. In the same period, we have always had Environmental Protection Agency, EPA. We have always had natu National Protection. NPP, 
National Protected Area Authority, right? We have always had these institutions, those things have happened. That is to naysayers who say, oh, you have EPA. EPA, amongst other things, does not go to cabinet. Um, they are part, as part of the former configuration, it was part of, it reported to the Ministry of Lands. And the full name of the Ministry of Lands is Ministry of Lands, Housing, Country Planning, and the Environment. So you see, the environment there looks like an afterthought. Looks like a far-flung marginal thing. Even in the name, the description of the ministry. So the president now wants to make it fore and center of his agenda. It is not going to cost government an arm and a leg. I have to say this. This is where many journalists have got it all wrong. Right? They, you have got it all wrong. This is not going to cost an arm and a leg. It's not going to cost government a fortune. For those of you who are aware of how government operates, you already, they are not going to recruit a permanent secretary exclusively for that ministry. They are not going to ex recruit administrators for that ministry. The civil service already has these people. They are in public service already. They are being paid. So what government will do will simply be to transfer them to the new ministry. I hope this is understood. It's not going to cost this country a fortune. It's not going to cost us an arm and a leg, just for emphasis sake. It is simply, the, probably, the only two things you have to do, you have to identify an office space for the new minister, who will now have to take a pay cut, sadly enough, where well, he's welcome to our club, and he will have to be assigned a derelict vehicle as well. My deputy minister's vehicle broke down a couple of days ago when we are going to attend a cocktail to discuss the repeal. These are the kind of derelict vehicles we use. So I want to take this opportunity to welcome my new colleagues on board, but just to check the misinformation. Again, I don't blame you. You did not have all the facts. Sadly enough, you did, not, you did not check with us. I am open. I will answer questions. The ones I can't answer, I will bring, I will make appropriate references. So, let me reiterate, it is not going to cost this question, this country, a fortune like the naysayers there have been presenting. This is within normal government operational budget. It's the same thing for the Gender and Children's Affairs Ministry, right? Over the years, the women have been crying for a women's commission. It's more expensive to set up a commission than a ministry because the ministry, you know, you have normal civil servants, you transfer there. Commission, you're going to recruit people, you're going to give them competitive commission wages. So the president considered, he has listened to the cries of the women over the years, he has heeded the clarion call to establish an exclusive ministry to look for it. Again, don't ask me. You know, this ministry is already part of, was part of the Ministry of Social Welfare, Agenda and Children's Affairs. So again, it's not costing government any extra amount, contrary to what has been, you know, um, thrown out there for unsuspecting members of the public, right? So I think this should be able to address those things. I I'm happy that the discussions are never again about national completion of the cabinet, because in the reshuffle, His Excellency went to far flung Fal Falaba and brought people there to demonstrate trust and confidence he elevated the ministry, the former deputy ministry of defense to a full-blown ministry now, headed by a northerner. His, deputy, um, his national security advisor is a northerner. So nobody's bringing a northern question on the table again. So the woman will say, in 18 months, we have given 27.9%. Going forward, this is work in progress. We will continue to do it. So that's that for the cabinet. I will come now to the budget. I just started mentioning um, the minimum wage increase, um, the small medium enterprises. Um, I like to talk about the young men along the beach. Um, this government um, has committed to diversifying our economy. His Excellency President Julius Marabu articulated said that during his last seat at the opening of Parliament. He did say um, this country has suffered far too long for our reliance on the extractive industry, which is susceptible to fluctuations in global commodity prices. So we are now going to diversify the economy. Again, as a man of his words, as a talk and do president, he has implemented the visa on arrival policy in Sierra Leone. So problems he started to encounter and having to travel to Sierra Leone are now history. You don't have to travel to a second, third, fourth country to get a visa to come here. As long as you meet the requirements, you can be visited on arrival at the Frita International Airport or wherever, the other entry ports. This will make um, 
traveling, uh, you know, a look forward to experience. It will make it an endearing experience. But over and above all, in this 2020 budget, we have also ensured that we have removed all GST on air travel um, arrangements. So things like parking charges, landing charges, you know, um, your tickets will no longer be GST charged. This is to ensure that we, jet, we trickle down, um, we reduce the, the prices of tickets, right? To an extent that some of you around the table can now afford tickets to take your families for holidays, even if to Banju, to some place. Why are you thinking that is possible? Even in the coasting days, which I recognize does not happen. <laughs> you know, I've been around the media for too long. Over two decades, I've had very intimate relations with the media. So when I talk about these things, I'm not talking about a Hollywood movie. I've lived it. I've seen it. You know, and I'm happy that the media is coming of age. Right? And I'm happy that I'm going to be part of this journey. Right? So you're getting salaries as we go along. So, like I was saying, we are going to remove those things to ensure that we attract tourists to Sierra Leone. We make Sierra Leone an attractive tourist destination. So in that regard, we are creating 3,000 new jobs full complement of jobs you require at the beach. For beach combers, for security guards, full complement of jobs. I mean, this is to ensure that the beaches are prepared as we expect the floodgates of tourist arrivals into the country. And that is very, very important. And you know the thing about tourism, it is not only those 3,000 people who will be able to earn money to look after bread and butter issues for themselves and their families. You know, when tourists enter a country, they don't have an auntie they go to stay with here. They're going, they're going to check into a hotel. Right? When hotels boom, they can increase salaries. They can bring additional hands on board. They are going to buy handicraft and a lot more things. So the multiplier effects on the economy will be massive. So watch this space. Right? I just know there is a very important role that journalists too can play. Can we decide, can we resolve at this meeting that we're going to be Sierra Leoneans? We're not going to be APC, we're not going to be SLPP, we're just going to be Sierra Leoneans. We want a thriving nation that will be prosperous, and will have a role to play. This country has pristine and breathtaking touristic potentials in aqua tourism, nature, every kind of tourism you think of. Can we all resolve to market that? Not the usual man eat dog story. Mohamed Suare in $5 billion scandal. <laughs> Minister of Information caught drinking beer. You know, we can get, we can elevate the discourse like I've always enjoyed you. I mean, you guys are a valuable part of the jigsaw going forward into the future. And I trust with the caliber of men I see around, um, we can do it if we choose to. And that's very important. So I was asked this question, like um, my Deputy Minister and Chairperson of the press conference said, I am just returning from Bakini. Actually, this is not the first provincial press conference I've had here. But we are getting a more organized approach, you know, some series with clear calendar, you know, um, so you know when you'll be where. We have done quite a couple of fire brigade approaches in the provinces, but we want to get more scripted now. We know on the last day, like you have with the cleaning period, that's what we started today. And it was very interesting, you know, it was a very interesting interactive session. I started my day off today, 6.37. I was on the, at, at, at one of the radio stations in McKinney, one hour, I got there and I did. I even unveiled the regional office of Slide today, um, just to demonstrate the partnership, even while I was running to come here. So in the provinces again, um, this budget has ensured that we will now practice local content in its true sense of the word. You cannot stay in Frita anymore and get a contract in both to supply Plasas to prison or to supply firewood to prison. But that is very insulting to all of those people living in the provinces. So if you now have a firewood contract for prisons in Bakeni, somebody in Bombali district, ordinarily resident there, will have to win that contract. Not somebody associated with Bakeni or not somebody who simply knows somebody in government. We want to create wealth for our people in those communities. We want to revitalize the economy in those communities rather than fattening up bank accounts in Frita, lining up pockets of technocrats and bureaucrats in Frita. We want the world to go where the action is. Isn't that an interesting feature of this budget? 
So if you have been having a contract here as a firewood supplier, Bo, sorry, I have bad news for you. The people who resident there will now be taking that contract. Right? So the other bit of it is that, you know, His Excellency is very big on agriculture. His desire is to be able to reduce by half the amount we currently spend on the importation of our staple food rice. We are spending in excess of $200 million every year on importation of rice. His Excellency wants to reduce that by half by the time he completes his second, his first term before we renew his mandate for a second term. So, we want to emphasize agriculture, as he, he, he said last time around. So, we're going to have youth or young people in agriculture together with the army, right? The necessary modalities are now being worked out, but a reasonable amount of money has been allocated for that. Agriculture is one of the biggest employers in our country, in most West Africa anyway, except in places where ICT is thriving, but that's the biggest employer. So we want to ensure that we, we go back to the land, give the men and women the necessary wherewithal so that they can grow what they eat. We grow what we eat, yeah, and it's what we grow for the most part. So that is happening as well. Of course, we have always had the issues of people living with disabilities. Again, my brother and colleague just mentioned there is a commitment for 16 technical vocational institutes across the country because TechVoc is about building up middle level manpower. I have worked for many mining companies in Sierra Leone. I have seen um, mining companies fly in people from various West Africans, you know, around the world for to become masons, to become you know, for artisan roles, artisanal roles. Roles like electricians, carpenters, plumbers, they have flown people in in the past because they always challenge us who don't have the requisite technical ability. So His Excellency has taken that up. That is why we're establishing and equipping these tech folks across the country so that early school leavers who wish to continue careers can pursue those. Uh, it's not an undignified job at, at, at all. I have worked with some of these guys, they fly in as third country nationals in these roles, they earn more money than us who were in senior leadership in many of these mining companies. So it's a very dignified thing. It's not a role for dropouts. It is where the jobs are. That is where the money is. Right? So that is provided for. So we are not leaving our physically challenged constituency behind. We're going to ensure that they access technical vocational institutions for, you know, to upskill them and also make sure that they are also able to benefit from the National Microcredit Scheme so that, you know, they can begin to earn decent and legitimate livelihoods for themselves and their families. But that's the only thing. As it is now, it's embarrassing. These, these are no lesser human beings. They are confederates. You see them chasing vehicles, begging, sometimes in extremely difficult circumstances. That is a nightmare His Excellency wants to end. You cannot be more humane than that. Um, you know, we, real, we originally wanted to bring in the Minister of Finance himself. Um, nobody can speak about these issues than him. We have to, we, we own this to him. You know, in, in, in McKinney, a journalist asked me, why did they not sack the Minister of Finance during the reshuffle? Mm -hmm. My response to him, like I will give to you now, is that we are lucky to have somebody of his pedigree. You don't have to like him. This is fact. He is amongst one of those very celebrated Sierra Leonean economics um, who has worked for many institutions. He understands, he, he understands at his fingertips this country's development challenges more than many armchair critics who sit now and criticize the current economic situation. Mr. Jacob Jesus Safa, right, has taken an economy that was on life support machine, right, to stability, to stabilization. We know we are not there yet. We are trying to grow the economy. That is why the economic management team at the Ministry of Finance is building, busy laying the, the building blocks, layer by layer, block by block, so that we we'll get to where we want to. I mean, I have challenged anybody. You, you could bring anybody from London School of Economics, from Harvard Business School, from anywhere. The, the macroeconomic fundamentals of this country have been broken. We are rebuilding it. So... The economy cannot be built overnight, but I'm glad that the team is taking the challenge in their stride. And look, we are already getting there. 
from an economy that hardly paid its, its, its public sector workers two months, two years before we came to power, except through bank borrowing or overdraft, we have been able to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And you also know what's happening in neighboring economies, right? Some go three, three or so months without paying public sector workers. We cannot have that here with the kind of leadership we have. So we continue to say, exercise some patience, bear with us, hope is on the way, as reflected in the People's Bread and Butter budget. Thank you very much, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. Throughout, I don't want to rain too much on your parade. Thank you. Thank you very much. listen. So the update will come out today. Inside the Ministry of Information and Communication and Press Briefing, we then called today. And also today inside the press briefing, we began to with the Deputy Minister of Technical and Higher Education. We can talk about coordinating them and development when they happen in your ministry. And also today we began to with the Minister of Information and Communication. We talk about the work where the President don't they do in order for involved women them in government issues. We will bring the press briefing program to you today. My name is Nakona. As you say. So, till we meet again to another edition of Press Briefing, I say, Tata. -ta.